thank you everybody for those who come back again and those of you that have made it to everyone and you that have made it to a couple and a few new faces. So thank you all for making it out. I know traffic is particularly terrible today. So <laughs> you guys are faithful um, and awesome. So just some introductions for those who it's your first time. Um, my name is Dr. Alyssa Jarvis. I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, work in Chesapeake, live in Hampton, so I understand the traffic commute is horrible. But uh, just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I went to Regent University, got my doctorate there, graduated last summer. Um, originally from Texas, moved here for grad school with no intentions of staying, but then I met him. <laughs> and so now I'm stuck in all the most wonderful ways possible. But I do like this area. Um, so that's a little bit about me, and I wanted to let him introduce himself. So Devin, Devin Jarvis, from this area originally, specifically Norfolk, I came to Hampton for school. I will be graduating in August with my doctorate of pharmacy. Um, I am also a licensed minister, and so we're going to be teaching today on effective communication. And we're going to be hitting it from two major perspectives. That's from a psychological perspective and also from a faith-based perspective. And so just kind of give you guys a quick introduction of who I am. So. And also want to just let you guys know that, so even though I am a psychologist, I'm not offering mental health services today. So I just have to make that disclaimer. Um, I just want to be able to share some knowledge with you guys and be happy if any of you have a question to answer it, to consult a bit, but I just want to let you know this isn't mental health services. Um, we're both actually part of a church ministry and just really wanted to give, out, give back to the community. We like to see lives transformed in every way possible, so wanted to give back in that way. And so, as she just stated, so this is being sponsored. If you look back there, you can see our little flag on the, <laughs> on, on the table there. This is being sponsored by Transform HVA. We are a uh, separate campus from a church that's in Norfolk, and we're here starting a campus here in Hampton. And the reason why we're doing this, the reason why we're starting the church in this manner, is that we want to be a church that's about faith and action. You know. I, we're not here to preach prosperity gospel. We're not here to do all the different things. We're here to serve the community and build a community that is that is rooted in faith and love, and that's faith in action. And so that's I think it's fitting that the way that we're coming into the city is just starting off by giving. Before you know, a lot of you know a lot of churches will come in places asking, "This is what you can do for us. This is what we can do for us. Sign up for this. Sign up for this." We want to come here and say, "Hey, we're here to give to the community." We're here to let people know well, this is what we're about and then show that you know we're here to love and truly serve. And our goal is to get connected with other people and to spread this type of mentality into the city. This world has a lot of hate, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration. We don't need any more of that. We need more love, and that's kind of what we want to teach in this city. And that's why we're called Transform HVA. Our goal is to transform the city of Hampton here in Virginia. And so... Katie back there. Hey, Katie, how's it going? She has these sheets here for all of our new friends that are here. You can wave a hand for them. And what we do is that we had all the new people fill this out with your email and things like that so we can email you the slides. Notice we don't have notes because it's a lot of paper. <laughs> so we are, we are in 2019. We like to send things out electronically. We're not going to do a bunch of soliciting. We're not going to be like, hey, you know, we like you to donate to this. We're not into all that. You want to see the notes and relevant lecture material, different things like that. And so we wanted to give out that information in the beginning. And we may have a couple of people trickling through the end, so we'll kind of make this announcement again. All right, thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I like to sit. Get my seat here. One more hand raised for anybody okay. new. Cool. There we go. One more hand raised. Okay, y'all are good. Just wanted to make sure we didn't miss anybody. We'll also send, um, for those who renewed, the PowerPoint to the last two that we did also, so that we have access to those. Go ahead. All right. So we want to get started. Um, here's a little outline of some things that we're going to talk about today. Um, I want to discuss the first two points, and then Alyssa is going to talk about the latter two points. And... I love how fancy her sounds, communication styles, and how to communicate assertively, how to listen, and how to filter our speech. I'm real, real direct and real simple. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, a lot of people 
have difficulty listening. And if we're going to talk about effective communication, the key to effective communication is effective listening. So, this is going to, and like I said, I'm doing a faith based perspective. So, this is going to serve kind of uh, as the foundational scripture where we're getting these principles of communication. James chapter 1, verse 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Um, James wasn't just some regular old guy. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and so and he was the brother of Jesus, and so he was quite an authoritative figure. And, and so he was saying, hey guys, let me give you some help. We need to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And I'm going to kind of break down these points to kind of help us have some greater understanding on these topics. And so there's a lot here, but it's okay. I'm going to get the PowerPoint, so I'm going to really, I know how tempting it is to read all of this, listen to what I'm saying, and then you can go back and read this and stuff, but try to focus on what I'm saying, it's going to help. And so, we're talking about swift to hear. Um, the fastest thing that we should be doing, when, and by swift it doesn't mean literally quick, what the greatest bulk of our attention should be given to is listening. Um, there's the old... The whole saying that we have two ears and one mouth. So we should be spending twice as much time listening than we do talking. Um, and so I guess a good place to start is there's a difference between hearing and listening. And this is where this gets me in trouble a lot because I have pretty good hearing. And so I'll be in conversation with, with Alyssa and she'll say something and she'll be like, are you even listening to me? And then I'll rattle back what she's saying. And so, there we go, I've been listening. Well, you know, I heard her. There's a difference between hearing and listening. Um, hearing is a physiological process. It's the vibrations and the eardrum and all that different stuff, and you hear sounds, and that's, that's hearing. Like when I slap the table, you hear that sound, that's, 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 all it is. that's all it is, it's a physical response. Listening, uh, I like how it was put in this one book. It says if you trace back the the Anglo-Saxon origins of the word, it says that um, listening can be understood as this. It's hearing with expense, with expenseful weight, with suspenseful waiting. Meaning, you're not just hearing what the person is saying, but you're waiting in suspense. You're, you're literally holding on to every single one of their words. And so, when we're truly listening, it's not enough to hear, but we need to be waiting in suspense, grabbing on to every single one of their words. If, if that's the type of mental picture that we have, and that we're hanging on, and we're just trying to give them our full attention, just that alone already make your listening all the more better. And so, I want to give you guys some tips on some good listening. Here's three listening skills. It can be divided as such. Tending skills, following skills, and reflective listening skills. So the tending, it's a... Uh, and so a way that we can understand attending. So here's the point of it. What it does is it breeds familiarity. It brings a sense of intimacy and fondness in the communication. So when it comes to attending, that's things like having a posture of involvement. Okay, Devin, what does that mean? A posture of involvement is when the person's talking, one, make sure you're facing them, right? You, you know, it's, it's with your body language, demonstrate to the person that you're listening. You know, there's a difference between, let's say you're talking to somebody, you're kind of like this, you're just like, kind of looking around, right? No, 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 you want to look like you're involved physically what you're saying. It's not enough to be hearing, so it's, it's sitting forward slightly, you know? It's making the appropriate eye contact. It's, it's nodding and getting with them, and it's, it's a face that's interested. If, if you're like, like just so flat in your face, and you're like unresponsive, and you're just like, staring at them, and your mouth is kind of hanging open, right? You're not really, you're not captivating them. You know, if you've ever, if you've ever had the opportunity to speak before a crowd or, or have a teacher before a crowd, if the class looks interested, the teacher is going to teach better. If you look interested in the person talking, it's going to help them communicate better. So you want to have a posture of involvement that's, that's kind of just really zoning in and 
Um, another way that we can have attending skills, things that breeds familiarity, that brings that closeness, that intimacy, is you want to eliminate a distracting <coughs> environment. There's four different skills that goes with this. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I do want to talk about the distracting environment because this is the one that a lot of different uh, couples struggle with, or even amongst friends. Distract two biggest distractions. Number one, what well, depends on the setting. Let's say you're at a house. Two biggest ones. One, your phone. My goodness, is your phone a distraction? So let's say, you know, she comes home and she's talked to me about her day. You know, I can be like this. <sighs> yeah, yeah, your day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, what is this? What am I doing? I have this distracting environment. I need to set this aside as I'm giving her my attention. Another big distraction, and my goodness, is the TV. You know, I know we love our sports, or we love the news, or we love our cooking shows, or like flip this house, whatever you like to watch on TV, it doesn't really matter. You know, your partner, your significant other, your friend, whoever it is, they come into the house, right? And, and so, you're in the best part of the show, like you're involved. Like, let's say you're watching, I don't know, NCIS or something, and like you're in the thick of the plot, like you're about to figure out who did this murder, like you are with it, right? I mean, you're just deeply involved into the show. And your significant other or your partner comes and they start conversating with you. So now you have to make a decision. How much do you really value this show? One, you should have DDR or have it recorded anyway so you can watch it later. So this wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> but let's just say you did record it, right? And so now you, have to, you know how you have to make a decision. You're like, my goodness, this is the best part. I've sat here for 28 minutes. I'm about to figure out what I've been wanting to figure out. I'm emotionally invested into this at this point. I really want to know. You know, or a more modern show, like uh, The Good Doctor. My God, I love The Good Doctor. You know, and so you're like th enthralled, and they come, hey, so uh, this is what happened in my day. And I'm like, Ugh. thank God for Hulu. Let's pause it. So you can pause it and turn the TV off. That's what we should do. Pause it and turn the TV off and, and kind of face the person and give them your attention. We want to create a non-distracting environment. And so, on the flip side, if you're going to talk to your significant other, try to figure out when they're most free during the day. They should be accommodating to the conversation. But of course, you know, you don't, the time to have a great or serious conversation is not immediately when they get off work. Don't do that. If you think about doing it, just slap yourself in the head, don't do that. <laughs> Bad idea. And if you think you really want to do it, Imagine my floating, bald, brown head, just, no, don't do it. Bad idea. They just getting into the door, they're probably really tired, and if they work a stressful job, the last thing they want is for you to do is emotionally dump on them after they've just been at work all day. You know? Like, like a psychologist, so she deals with pretty heavy stuff all day. The last thing she needs for me, the moment she walks in, man, I have this jerk at the pharmacy, Mike, let me tell you about my hard day. My goodness, let her breathe. You know, vice versa. So we need to be strategic about picking times to communicate. So like when you just get off work or in preparation for dinner or immediately after dinner because you get the itis and you eat and you especially you've been throwing down, you've been eating real good, so you get kind of sleepy afterwards, you start getting drowsy, that's not the time. You know, know your partner, know your spouse, figure out what's a good time to communicate, all right? And so there's that's attending skills. Then there's following skills. It creates the environment for disclosure. It makes them more apt, more willing, more likely to continue to share and to communicate. So Devin, what do you mean? So a lot of times when we're listening, we have this problem called talking too much. If you're listening, why are you talking? No, 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 no. And so there's this idea, it's called minimal encourager which is the fancy word for, uh-huh, yeah, is that, is that so, oh, okay. Those, those little things, those little words, those cues that say keep going, it lets you know that you're with them, right? That's called a minimal encourager. We need to do that. That's, that's one thing that you can do to show them that you're not just listening, but you're following, that you're with them, that you're engaged, that you're connecting with them, right? That's, that's something that we can do. Our, when, when, when you're in the listening mode, and keep in mind the listening and speaking, that bounces back. 
whoever the primary speaker and the primary listener through the course of a lengthy conversation, that goes back and forth. But when the person is talking and you're listening, when they're talking, oh yeah, right, yeah, yeah, so, you know, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do that. Thing number two you can do, infrequent questions. <coughs> infrequent questions. Every time they make a comment, you don't need to ask a question. <laughs> oh, I had a rough day. Oh, what happened? Oh, this person did what? Oh, did they? They did what? Yeah, no. Oh, I can't believe they did that. Oh, why would they do What are you doing? <laughs> Stop that. Don't, don't do that. No. Oh, but babe, I'm just trying to really be there for you. No, you're being annoying. Stop. <laughs> Infrequent questions. They're talking. You're listening. Okay? And then this one, reflecting listening skills. Yo, I thought I knew how to reflect and listen until like I did some study. Nah. This this dude blew me away. And so, um, reflective listening. Okay. Most of us are probably generally familiar with the idea of reflective listening. And so let's say you're engaged in a conversation and they're talking to you and they're relaying information and you and you just paraphrase back to them what they said. For a lot of people, that's the extent of reflective listening. And reflective listening is one of the most important points in effective communication because so many problems in relationships is because of poor communication. It's because the, the person was misunderstood. Reflective listening is the key to making sure that the other person is understood. And you want to do three things when you're reflective listening. You want to understand the facts of what they're saying. You want to understand the feelings of what they're saying. And when you put those together, you can derive the meaning. A lot of times when we're listening, we're just listening to understand what they said. To get the facts. To get the details. If all you're getting is the facts and the details, my goodness, you're not reflective listening. We need the facts, the feelings, so you can put that together and you can pull out the meaning. You know, um, an example that I heard one time is, you know, so say that she came and she was talking to me about her boss. And she was really complaining about her boss. And so I could, I could respond back, here's the facts. Uh, you're complaining about your boss, your boss is annoying. Okay, that's a fact. So how is she feeling? She's annoyed. Because she said, hey, I'm annoyed. And so you put those together. So you, just, you do a little bit of thinking, okay, so the boss is being intrusive, that's the fact, she feels annoyed, and so this is when the reflective listening comes in, and you repeat back to her, oh, so do you feel, you probably feel annoyed because your privacy is being violated, and you start bringing understanding, and so then they start talking, and I want to let you know, this process does not happen overnight. Reflective listening is a skill that takes time. And there's so many intricate details I would love to share with you, but here are some key things that can really help with reflective listening. So one, just remember that pattern, first of all. When you're listening to what they're saying, you want to get the facts squared away. For most people, that's not the difficult one. You want to get the facts, figure out what they're, figure out what they're actually saying. So who, what, when, where, why, what's going on, different things like that. Just kind of figure out and kind of lay the scene. So you go, okay, now you have an idea of what's happening. Feeling. You want to look for feeling words. So look for words that evoke emotions. I felt this. Or I'm annoyed. Or, you know, read their body language. Or this person really upset me. Or I didn't anticipate this happening this way. You want to look for, they're not going to always say I'm happy or I'm sad. You got to look into the words and see what words in their speech has the feelings. And then... When, and so you're like, well, when am I going to have time to be thinking about all this? And all that time you're being silent and you're listening, you have plenty of time to be thinking about this. That's the only way this works. It only works if you're good at listening. If you're talking, 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 all you're trying to do is figure out what you're trying to say. But if all your time is spent hearing them, understanding what they're saying, and understanding what they're feeling and how they're feeling, and then repeating that back to them, the beautiful thing is you can say, Hey, when this happened, it made you feel like this. When this, you felt this. And when you do that, 
now you they can respond and they can tell you how accurate what you're saying is or, or isn't. And so then that helps eliminate some of the miscommunications. Well, I didn't quite feel like that's what happened, but I really didn't feel annoyed. Okay, and so you give them a chance to talk and explain, oh, and so you felt maybe you felt sad. Yeah, I wasn't annoyed, I was really hurt by this. And so now you understand, and you're more equipped to go forward and interact and behave with them because now you understand how they feel. Because the way you deal with an angry person and the way you deal with a sad person is very different. The facts can be the same, but how they feel makes all the difference. That's why it's important that we get reflective listening. Um, I like here in Proverbs, it said that he that hath knowledge spared his words. A man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. There is wisdom that God really appreciates when we learn how to be good listeners and not as fantastic talkers. There's a time to talk. So I'm going to speed through this because I want to make sure I don't go over my time. So, so first we're talking about swift to hear. Now I'm going to talk about slow to speak. I love this, this, this um, psalm here. This is King David. He says, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lips. And, and the Hebrew language is very visual by nature. So imagine this. Imagine your mouth as a door, and there's a guard standing outside the door with, a, with some other weapon. That's how we need to view our speech. We are too easy and too careless with what we're thinking and how we're feeling. We're, we are way too comfortable just stepping out and saying, well, I feel this, or this, and this, or this. No, no, no. We need to be weighing and considerate of our words. Um, when we look back into the book of Genesis, we see that when God was creating the world, he spoke the world into existence. And so we see because of that being made in his image that our words have power. Oh, well, Devin, well, I don't quite know if I believe in that. Um, when people are getting bullied, the things that they say or said to them hurt a whole lot worse than the things that are done. Because a broken arm will heal, but it's really hard to heal from being afflicted because of someone attacking your insecurity. You know? So, let's say you, say, let's say you struggle with, uh, like me, so one of the things I struggle with is my intelligence. Is I'm going to remember my parents saying to me, man, you're a dumb kid. You know, you kind of screwed up here, bud. I'm going to remember that and that's going to be a lot more impacting, far more than any time they hit with the bell. I'm not going to remember that. I'm grown. I mean, they hit me. It's, it's good. Like, my bottom is fine. I don't hurt. I'm chilling. You know, I can walk. I'm good. But that, that'll resound through my mind. Oh, you're a dumb kid. You're a stupid kid. Or you messed up. Or, you know, that stuff, that kind of resounds. And, and so you can imagine getting into a heated debate with the person that you love. you got to replay that argument in your mind. You're like, yo, I can't believe they said that. I can't, man, who did they think they were talking? They said, what to me? Man, I can't believe, you know, that's going to be resounding here. Our words are powerful. We have to understand the power of our words. So when we start to understand how powerful our words, that becomes a motivator to, okay, I need to control it. There is a lot of scripture about the devastating power of our words. The Bible gives a lot of attention to that. I could have had a whole sermon just on how powerful our words are. Life and death are in the tongue. It says the tongue is set ablaze, a uh, burning fire. The hardest member to control in our body is our tongue. The Bible is very clear that speech is a big deal. And so I want to give you guys some helpful tips on how we should speak. And really it's just a guideline to kind of just get you thinking. If, if all I could do today is to get you to be more considerate about your speech, trust me, that by itself will make an impact. I'm going to give you some things I think are helpful. And so, Ephesians chapter 4, it says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. And I want to focus right there. That which is good for the use of edifying. I'm going to put that in good old modern English for us. If what you're saying isn't building or encouraging the person, it doesn't need to be said. Now, that doesn't mean be fluffy and nice all the time. 
time. That's not what that's saying, you know. Different temperaments need different approaches. But what I'm saying, if what you're about to say ain't going to lift a person up, probably shouldn't say it. You know, um, there's this cool little acronym that I got, and this will be my last slide here. It's a THINK. THINK before you speak. If you go through this laundry list, and at first it's going to seem really, really hard, like, oh, that's a lot of internal dialogue. Okay, at first it's going to seem challenging, but the more you do it, trust me, the easier it gets. First of all, is what you're saying, what you're about to say, is it true? Well, how do I know if it's true? Well, have you heard all sides? Does someone come and gossip to you, and now you're about to turn up on somebody because they gossip to you, and now you're about to let somebody know your, you know your mind? You need to know the whole matter before you speak. The Bible talks about that. It says the fool speaks without knowing the whole matter. Before you go to say something or confront somebody, and we'll talk more about this in a conflict resolution, we need the whole matter. Okay, so is it true? Is what you're saying true? It needs to be true. Number two, if it is true, then think, is it helpful? Is what you're saying going to help the situation or this person? If you're really irritated and this person is being uh, uberly annoying, is saying, hey, you're kind of a jerk. I want to sock you in the face. You're annoying. That's true. <laughs> but is it helpful? Probably not. And so we want to say things that are true, but we also want to say things that are helpful. Okay? And so, then there's three. Is it inspiring? What do you mean by that? Is what you're saying going to motivate them to act in a way that's going to make things better? When you're in a relationship, you need to become an expert motivational speaker. Because you need to be able to fluff their pillow and motivate them to do the right thing to stop them from being so annoying. And that goes both ways. And so you need to, and so there has to be a way to express being annoyed that's motivational. You know, hey, uh, this situ whatever situation, maybe they didn't put the dishes away. Hey, uh, you know, I, I really do prefer when you put the dishes away because when you do that, we get to spend more time together. Or, you know, or, you know, a lady, she can be talking to her guy friend and be like, hey, babe, I like it when you put the dishes away. That makes you look real sexy. I like that. Put the dishes away. You know what I'm saying? You know what turns me on? Dishes being put away. I feel in a good mood, you know? You want to be motivation. You want to put some motivation instead of saying, hey, you're an adult. I told you to put this away. Go do it. You know, that's... that's Inspiration, be inspiring, you know, be motivational, all right? All right? And so let's say it is true, let's say it is helpful, let's say it is going to inspire them. Is it necessary? Does it really need to be done? Is what you're saying really that necessary? I mean, like, honestly, like, stop and reflect. If this doesn't happen, is this going to make or break your relationship? Is it going to make or break your interactions? Like, is it necessary? I, that's really a little bit harder to get more detail on. Like, you know your individual self. Just think to yourself, do I really need to say this? Like, or am I going to be an hour later, look back on it, and feel really bad about what I said? That is it necessary? And is it kind? It can be true. It can be helpful. It can be inspiring. It can be absolutely necessary. I mean, my goodness, it's burning in your bones. You have to say it, right? But... Is it kind? Is it kind? You want to make sure that what you're saying is kind. You don't want to just say the right thing. You want to say the right thing the right way. Tone makes all the difference. Coming from somebody with a really harsh tone, my goodness, tone makes all the difference. You want to make sure you're saying the right thing the right way. And all of this can be summarized in this proverb. A word fitly spoken. It's like apples of gold and pictures of silver. So you have a bowl. If you have golden apples, you're not going to put them in a wooden bowl. You're not, let's say whatever, you have some nice ornamentation. You're not going to put it in something trashy. You know? You're not going to get your nice china set and put it in a plastic bag. You're going to put it in a nice cabinet. You, it's not enough to say the right thing. you got to say the right thing the right way at the right time. So those are just a couple of things I want to share with you guys. We want to make sure we're endeavoring to be swift to hear and slow to speak. Thank you. Okay.
Devin gave some general principles about communication and listening and talking and how to do it. Um, what I want to talk about in my half is communication styles, but specifically, how do we usually go about trying to get our needs met? Because we all have needs and we all have different ways of trying to get those met. And we all have different ways of communicating our needs. So I'm going to go through three different communication styles that usually we fall into, one of them. Or maybe we flip flop back and forth, and I'll talk about that too. And then some kind of protocols for how to speak in a way that's more likely to get your needs met. Um, so the first communication style is passive communication. So this is when you're trying to get your needs met, but your goal, your main goal above everything else is to avoid conflict. So as soon as the other person starts to get upset, or their tone changes, or whatever, you back down, you're like, never mind, it's not that important, I'm okay, and you back down. Or you just don't even bring it up in the first place because you're afraid it might start conflict. This is a passive communication style. But there's several problems with this style. One is that you're not really expressing your thoughts and feelings and needs, and so then they're not met because the other person most of the time doesn't even know that they're there. <laughs> um, and when our needs aren't met, usually we start to get irritated, we start to get angry, we start to get really unhappy with the relationship. And over time, that anger usually builds up, and it may lead to us exploding on the person, or just walking away and they're confused of like, what happened? I didn't even know there was an issue. But to you, there's a big giant issue that's been simmering for forever, but it was never expressed. Um, and a lot of times, the anger can be turned inward to ourselves too. We can get angry at ourselves for not expressing it. Or we can get angry at ourselves even for having feelings <laughs> or having needs. That's a thing, too, with this style. Um, and because all of that's building up inside, it can cause health problems like headaches, stomach aches, all these different things in a relationship and can make the relationship really pleasant for us because our needs are not getting met. The next communication style is the opposite end of the spectrum, which is aggressive communication. So with this style, this is your way of communicating with people, you don't really care so much about whether there's conflict or not, you just want your need met. And like, okay, my needs need to get met, I'm going to make that happen. So then it's a bit more dominating and controlling of I'm going to be in control of this conversation, I know the outcome that I want, and I'm going to get there. Which, I mean, our needs are being met, so this is great, but it also has a host of different problems. Um, one is that we have our own bubble of our own needs and our own boundaries that we have, but so does the other person. And when we're in an aggressive communication pattern, then we don't care about the other person's bubble. We're constantly popping it, constantly invading it, and we're then going to push that person away, or they're going to respond aggressively, um, and it could create a lot of conflicts. Also, we could resort when we don't really care about how it affects the other person to things like blaming or name calling or putting the other person down, whatever it takes to get our point across and to get our needs met. And so as we can see, this also isn't a very healthy style. And what's interesting is a lot of people who have a passive style, when they get to the end of their rope, end up coming around to being aggressive because they have all this anger built up inside and don't know what to do with it. Um, also, I'm sure most of you have heard of passive aggressiveness, when someone isn't really saying what they want or what they need, they're beating around the bush, but then they have all these snarky, snide comments, and you're like, what is that about? I'm confused. Like, where is this coming from? That's from that passivity, but everything's building up inside and they can't quite hold it in anymore. So, those are those two. The last one, and this is the one I really want to focus on today, is assertive communication. So this is where we're getting our needs met, but we're also respecting other person's needs. And like, your needs are also important, but so are my needs. And respecting both sides. Um, now when we're communicating assertively, this means that we're being direct about what we want. We're expressing how we feel, we're expressing our opinions. But we're doing it in a way that's not going to harm the other person in the process. So, some of the tricks to this, and I'll really get into some more of this in detail, but using I statements. So the problem is, a lot of times we don't own our own emotions, our own opinions, and take responsibility for them. So when we're passive, we just ignore them and pretend they're not there. And so we're not owning them. Or when we're aggressive, we're blaming it all on the other person, and saying, this is you, this is your problem, your fault, and we're still not owning what our needs are. So assertive communication does take some level of courage, because we have to own up to what 
we're feeling and to where we stand in that moment. And we have to be able to communicate that, express that, which is using I statements. So saying, I feel frustrated when the dishes are sitting out all day and I wash them. So instead of saying, you need to put the dishes away, just expressing how I feel and owning up to how it affects you makes a big difference. And also the active listening that he talked about as well, because when we're trying to communicate assertively, that means we're also <coughs> respecting the other person's needs and boundaries. So it means we have to take the time to listen to their side, take time to pause and hear them out as well. Uh, so those are two key parts to assertive communication. But for most of us, this does not come naturally. So, as we talked about before, we're all raised in different types of families. For some of us, our families tend to solve things in a very passive way. Other families are a bit more aggressive. <coughs> I'm just to disclose a bit, my family is very passive in the way they handle things. So I've had to work a lot at being assertive because my family is not this way. Um, so this takes a lot, a lot, a lot of practice. And so I'm going to give you guys some models that I did not create. <laughs> they came from a wonderful... Um, skills training therapy called dialectical behavior therapy. So I have to give them the credit for that. But there's some really, really great models for working through assertiveness. So I don't want you to feel overwhelmed as I go through this. If you do, it's okay. But this just takes practice and it takes um, work at it. So when you want to get your needs met, this is a model for going through the conversation. So what I'm going to do is walk you through each step in the model and then I'll walk you through a conversation using the model so you can see each part in it. So the acronym is called Dear Man. So D stands for describe the current situation. A lot of times we skip this and we go straight into telling the person how we feel about something and they're sitting there like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I, I don't even know where you're coming from. So this is where this comes in. First you just describe, okay, this is the context for where this is coming from. I'm just gonna describe the situation and what's happening. Two, for E, is express your feelings and opinions about the situation. So this is where it comes into owning, okay, this is how I feel, this is how it's affecting me, owning it. A is asserting yourself by asking for, by asking for what you want or by saying no. So a lot of times we skip this step too. We'll express how we feel about something and expect our partner to get it and be like, you're supposed to get how to fix this. But the thing is, most of us are not that smart or intuitive and we need a little bit of help. So this step is by really saying what it is that you want the other person to do and what you expect out of them. Um, for R is reinforce. Reinforce ahead of time or explain the consequences. So what this means is kind of what he was talking about earlier with the being inspirational. <laughs> Letting the other person know how it's going to affect you when whatever change that you're asking for, whatever need you're asking for is met. Let them know how it's going to affect you. Because if your partner cares about you, and I hope that everyone here has a caring partner um, that cares about you, when they hear about how it affects you, then they're probably going to be more inspired to do it. So that's an important step. The last three are a little bit more nuanced, depending on the needs of the specific situation. M stands for mindful. So mindfully keep your focus on your objective and not get distracted. So you're bringing up this need that you have and your partner brings up something from five years ago and you're like, wait a second, we're about to get this derailed and go off on this argument about something five years ago when I'm saying this is my need right now. So acknowledge that and bring it back and let's not get into all these rabbit trail conversations and let's keep it focused on the objective right now. It makes it a lot more likely that your need's going to get met without blowing up into some argument. A is appear confident and effective which means have good eye contact. Try to speak with a calm tone and not yelling or hysterically crying, but just try to show that you're confident and you know what you're asking for and you're okay with it. This takes practice for some of us. <laughs> it might require writing down what you want to say and practicing it ahead of time, um, talking to yourself in the mirror or something, but really practicing these aspects because it can make a big difference as well. And the last one is negotiate. Because we're talking about assertive communication, that means the other person's not always going to agree with what we're asking for, and they may have their own needs that conflict with what we're asking for. So we have to be willing sometimes to give a little bit in order to get what we want. And I'll get to this a little bit more. What I don't 
not saying is give in your needs for someone else's needs or just submit yourself under someone else where your needs are never getting met, but find a compromise and find something that works for both of you. I'm also not saying to compromise your morals or values either. We have to know what we can compromise and what we can't, but it takes a give and take in a relationship. So what I want to do now is walk us through a conversation using this model. So he actually brought this up earlier. Uh, or no, no, not this one. It's another example he brought up earlier. But this one, the situation is partner wants to have friends over and you don't. So we're going to work this out and figure this out. So a describe is, I understand you really want to have friends over this evening. Okay, you're giving them the context of where this conversation is coming from, describing the situation. Express, because I've been at work all day, I'm feeling really tired and socially drained. I have to make sure I'm using this evening to re-energize for work tomorrow. If we have people over, I won't be able to relax. So really just letting them know where you stand and how this is going to affect you if this decision is made. Um, and just how you feel about it. Assert. So this is where we're specifically asking for what we want. I would really appreciate it if we didn't have company over this evening. Straight, direct, to the point, what you want out of this conversation. Reinforce. Letting them know how this is going to affect you if you do get what you want. So if I'm able to get some rest tonight, I'm sure I'll feel much more refreshed tomorrow. This is probably inspiring to your partner because they don't want a grouchy, tired partner tomorrow. <laughs> they want someone who's refreshed and is going to be able to give them the attention they need. So this is the first part of it. Now it comes to the conversation and where it goes from there. So now a partner says, but you got to have people over last week. <laughs> I, I don't get this. What's going on? Okay, you want to bring this back because we want to stay on topic. So you say, I know my request might seem confusing because I invited some of my friends over last week after work. But at the same time, I'm feeling particularly tired this evening, and I really need time to rest. So bringing it back to your initial request, without completely dismissing them, and, but bringing it back. Again, we have to stay confident. So when they start bringing up other things, let's not get really frazzled. Stay confident. Keep the eye contact. Keep all of that. And then negotiate. So partner says again, well, I get my energy from being around people. I'm tired too. Um, and I was really looking forward to hanging out with my friends this evening. Okay, well let's compromise, let's negotiate. So I would be okay with you going to their house for the evening and then I could stay home and rest and you could get some time with your friends and get your energy. So this is just an example. Every conversation is going to be very different. But again, it takes practice, lots of practice. So what I want to do now is walk you guys through two other models. One is for when maintaining peace in the relationship is really, really important at that moment. And the other one is for maintaining your stance <coughs> and really keeping true to yourself and your needs is extra important. So this first one is probably more relevant for people who tend to be a bit more on the aggressive style of communication and have a harder time with this. Um, but it's good for everybody. So this is when, say, you're bringing up a topic that you know historically has caused tension every time you bring it up. And you don't want that tension, but you really need to talk about it. And so these are things to keep in mind. Um, and this acronym is GIF. So the first one is gentle. So be courteous and balanced in your approach. Again, this comes to some of the stuff he was talking about earlier. But use a gentle tone of voice. Find a time of day where they're not particularly tired or something like that. And just cater to their needs. Be gentle in that moment. Eyes interested. So again, listen. Be interested in the other person. Give them your full attention. Even if you're the one that's coming across with your needs, we can't be so caught up in our needs that we forget to be interested in the other person and listen equally as much to their needs and hear them out. Validate. Validate the other person's feelings, wants, difficulties, and opinions about the situation. This can be really hard to do when we're dead set on what we want <laughs> to validate what they want. But there, again, their needs, their opinions, their emotions are equally as important as ours. So we really have to validate. And validate does not mean you agree with them. A lot of times we get mixed up on that. We think that if I'm validating you, then that means I agree with you. No, that's not true. Saying, I can tell you're really annoyed with this, is not agreeing with their point of view. It's just validating how they feel, because how they feel is very real. Or I can see that you're really tired this evening, Okay, maybe you're not agreeing that you don't want to have people over, but you're validating how they feel at the moment. 
So very, very important. And when the other person feels heard, they're much more likely to pause and hear you out. Because when your partner doesn't feel heard, they're going to keep going, 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 trying to pull their point across because they don't think that you understand it. But when you take the time to validate and reflect back how they're feeling, they're like, oh, you get me. Okay. So now I'm willing to hear your point out because I know that you heard me and you've got me. <coughs> and the last one, E is for easy manner. It's okay to use a little bit of humor. It's okay to smile and be diplomatic, even during these intense conversations. There's times we'll start to get in an argument and one of us will bring up some inside joke from the last argument and it'll make us both laugh and that diffuse the tension like that. So humor can be a really powerful tool. But the trick is, know what kind of humor your partner has. <laughs> Sometimes we have two different types of humor and they don't find something humorous at all in the moment. So it takes a little bit of tact, but it's okay to keep the conversation a little bit more lighthearted. So this next model is for people who tend to let other people walk over them and tend to get frustrated because every time they bring something up, they end up giving in to the other person. And when your point that you're trying to get across right now is really, really important. Um, so the acronym for this one is FAST. So the first one is be fair to yourself and to the other person. Sometimes we think that our needs are not as important as the other person's or that we're not worth hearing out or things like that. For different reasons, a lot of us have those messages that we tell ourselves. We have to remind ourselves that our points and our feelings are just as valid as the other person's and we have to be fair to ourselves just as we have to be with the other person in the conversation. A is for no apologizing, for making a request, having an opinion, or disagreeing. Again, a lot of times we feel bad when we have to ask for something. We feel bad when we are going to bring up a conversation that might cause conflict. Some of us feel bad for everything. <laughs> we ask a stranger where the bathroom is and we're saying, I'm sorry, where's the bathroom? <laughs> or we, um, we just apologize for absolutely everything. Okay, that's not necessary. Sometimes it's a habit for us, but it's not necessary. And it makes the person view us differently when we apologize, and it also makes us view ourselves differently. There's no problem with having a need, with having a request, with having a so there's no need to apologize. S is for stick to your own values. <coughs> Be clear on what you believe is the moral way to think or act. So if your partner is asking you to do something that is completely against your values or against your morals, stick to it. There's no need to go negotiate with that. We have to stick to our morals and our values and we have to communicate them. Again, we're all raised differently. We're raised in different families with different values and different ways we were brought up. So just because we think something is wrong doesn't mean our partner does. So we have to communicate why we feel the way we do to the best of our ability and really communicate that moral and that value. But we have to stick to them. And then T is for be truthful. So don't lie, act helpless, exaggerate, or make excuses. So again, for some of us this is hard, but we have to be direct and say what we need to say. Sometimes we'll exaggerate and try to blow things up way bigger to get our point across. Or sometimes we do the opposite. We really minimize where we stand on something. We're like, oh no, that's okay. That doesn't bother me at all. When actually inside you're fuming and it does bother you, we have to tell the truth. When something bothers us, let the person know. Um, if it's going to continue to fester and cause problems. If you can resolve it on your own, it's not a big deal. That's fine. You don't have to bring up every issue all the time. But it's important that we're truthful when we are bringing something up, when we are trying to get our point across. Um, and don't make excuses. So if you really don't want to do something, let the person know. Don't come up with every excuse in the book for why you're not going with them or why you're not doing this. Be truthful, be direct, let them know. Um, and if you're able to communicate that, then they're probably less likely to ask you again in the future. They'll understand you better. It's important that we're direct and we don't make excuses. So. Again, just kind of in conclusion, I know we went over a lot today, a lot of different models, but kind of, you know yourselves, you know your relationships, you know your dynamics, figure out which one of these you struggle with the most and really work on it. Or maybe work on the easier ones first and build yourself up. But it takes a lot of practice. So what I encourage all of you to do is don't get frustrated with yourself in this process and try to give your partner a little bit of grace too because this isn't going to happen overnight. It takes lots of practice. And if you need to type these out, hang it up on your fridge, and every time you go to get in an argument, say, wait, <laughs> I'm gonna go grab my sheet, I'm gonna walk through it. It might seem really cheesy, really
really corny, but if you both know that you're working through this together and you're really trying, it can make a big difference. And that can even be the humor that you needed in that moment to keep it a little lighter and less heavy and less conflictual. So just be patient with yourselves in this process and really practice, practice, practice. So that's all that I have. Um, you want to make a ending part? So first, I just want to say I almost died when I heard that music started. I almost lost it, y'all. I almost lost it. It was—I don't know—that music just suddenly came out of nowhere. I almost lost it. it was she laughs like, really easy, oh, and he can't stop once he starts. Like, I want to respect her teaching, but boy. <laughs> oh man, that was funny. Anyway, but okay. So I want to put this plug in, and we do it every week. Um, let's say you guys particularly struggle with communication like some more individualized sessions so that we can talk about some more specifics in communication, please reach out to us. Be like, hey, these are the particular things that we're dealing with. Here's the issues that we're having. Let us know. Email us. We can study up on some things, figure some things out, find some things that will be, be helpful for you guys. Meet one-on-one. -on -one we'll meet couple and couple. And kind of just work through some of these things. And just uh, maybe you need a mediator to have some discussion, some things you want to work through. We want to make ourselves available for that. There's a lot in here that, um, that we there's a lot that we couldn't add. And so, if you feel like there's other questions that you may have on communication that you'd like to have an extended conversation, please reach out to us. Here's our information here. And so, we have a couple minutes left. We want to open the floor for questions. We want to have it specifically for questions. We want to limit our comments because we are limited on time. And so, if there's comments that you would like to make, please catch us afterwards and we can kind of talk one-on-one, -on -one, okay? So we want to open the floor for questions.
all your friend can remember is, oh, they, they made my best friend feel like this, or they made my sister feel like this, or they made my brother feel like this. That's why it's important that we're really careful about where we're going to, to then. So I just having that objective outside party is really helpful. And a lot of times, like, for, I know I'm better at it now than before, you know, there's, I've had my seasons and times where I would rather just not talk about something, you know. But just what helped me to be better at working through it is seeing the value in the communication. Knowing that talking about it is going to make a difference. Because a lot of times if you feel like, oh, if, I get, if we start talking about it, we're going to argue, and I'm going to this, 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 and this. And they're like, well, what's the point? I'm saving us an argument. You know what I'm saying? And so to kind of help avoid, is help the, the partner to see the value in good communication and that it can do more good if the proper rules of engagement are put in place. Sure. Uh, um, are you still alive? Yeah. Are you still taping? Are you still alive? Yes. Well, I'm a fugitive, and I don't want to be identified. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to address the question that you had the partner that may be walking away. Um, some things that I learned with when my girls were younger with tough love, and you used the statement that Lisa and Devin had presented earlier, somewhere in your presentation, about uh, keywords like when you, then I. So your guy's name is Joe. And you say to Joe, when you walk away, Joe, and you're in the throes of a conversation, parentheses, when you walk away, Joe, then I feel, and then you expand on that. So you, even though he's physically walking away at some point, maybe he's hot-headed or whatever, and you need a minute like for him to kind of like cool off, you get a moment to, to speak with him, to say, when you, and you're thinking in your mind, when you make these actions or non-actions and you're non-verbal or you walk away or, then I feel, as Jane, I feel this way. And, you know, what Devin was saying also about, you know, I don't think there's a person on the earth that wants some sort of conflict, especially with a loved one or your significant other, whomever. You know, you want like a smooth ride all the time. And it's not always like that. And like Alyssa said, if you don't, if you don't bring it out, and it may not be easy, and it's ugly sometimes, but it's going to cook in you, and, and, you know. And the next argument is going to build on the one that was two weeks ago, and then you know the next one's going to build on the one that was four weeks ago, until you get it out. And it's hard, but hard is not impossible. And if you really care about them, and they really care about you in the relationship, then perhaps some of those gentle words allowing them to, to be able to maybe understand where you're coming from. Joe, when you do so-and-so, then I feel, and if that person really cares about your emotional stability, ability, and core, hopefully you'll, you'll reel them back in. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I mean, all these skills kind of go together and weave in and out of each other. Mm -hmm. And communication is kind of the core of everything else. Cause Communicate. We can't really work the rest out, um, but it does take practice, and it takes both parties, and it takes not giving up <laughs> because sometimes we just give up and say, "Forget it. I'm not going to communicate." But we can't do that. Yeah. Did you have your hand up? Oh, oh you're just <laughs> Okay. Sure. I went like I kind of like a philosopher in my heart or something. Like what new player I was thinking of. This seems like it's talking a lot about selfishness too. Like if you just have that in the core. I want what I want. There's like a real gut check between I have a preference, I'd like to ask you if you meet me in the middle with this thing that really helps me out, that's in my request. Or if I just like expect and demand like my way, you know, in this relationship and yeah, not what I want. And so then I'm not going to be interacting with you like a teammate, we're not going to get in and it's like we and us compromises, flexible, because I'm still going at it like I just get to have what I want, why yeah. you give me what I want and say. And that fits kind of with the communication style because aggressive a lot of times we think like physically aggressive or being really ugly, but that doesn't necessarily mean that. That just means you're encroaching on the other person's space. So if you're being selfish and really wanting what you want at the expense of the other person and not being willing to compromise, then that's an aggressive communication not, style. Or even like in the shutdown there, that's a power move. Like I'm just going to walk away. I'm going to shut the conversation down. I'm not going to let you finish expressing yourself or, you know, like, and I... I just like thought it's like a simple takeaway if I work on how to be like a healthy self. It stays in this flexible like me and us kind of conversation where you're not losing yourself, but I can still like see you over there instead of just me 
So this, I uh, appreciate commentary. I love it. I love it, guys. And this is this is my cup of tea. I love I love it. However, I want to just keep it for questions for now, and then we can we can end the recording and we can wrap up, and then we can then that way we can just have open dialogue because I love that. I love the Socratic just kind of brush off off each other. But I just want to make sure we bring it to an official close and that we're closed up because the facility is closed at eight o'clock. So that's when they start kicking everybody out. So we want to make sure we have time for everybody's questions. And then once we have all the chairs are put away and stuff, then we can, dude, I love to have a conversation. We can talk here, we can talk out there. Just I just want to make sure everybody has that has questions, have those questions answered for sure. I, but I'm loving, love the commentary. I love the discussion. I'm a huge fan. It's great. I just want to make sure all the questions that people have do get answered. Though. Were there any final questions? I know it's 7.31, so I don't want to hold you guys captive. But if there were any final questions, we'll make sure there's space for that. Well, all right. Well, thank you all for coming out. I appreciate it. Um, we have two more weeks of this. And next week is talking about conflict resolution. So I feel like we'll get into it a little bit more. It's what the questions are about. And but thank you again. All right. Thank you all. And turn in, um, for all of you who have the sheets, you can just turn them in at the back table over there. And we'll collect those. <laughs>